2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. Uh, this is a review of what we talked about last Sunday morning, and that section that's highlighted there in green and blue and pink are one of the things we spent most of our time on last week. Uh, the green reads, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation. And we looked last week at the doctrine of Calvinism and how they interpret that idea and think about that idea. I did a little bit of discussion about that. And then pointed out that Paul here explains a little bit about how that works because he said, God from the beginning chose you for salvation through the sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And we spent some time talking about sanctification and what that means and how that's accomplished. Uh, we talked about how important, obviously, belief is. Uh, without faith, it is impossible to please God. We know that scripture teaches that. And so we didn't go into all the scriptures about belief because I think you were familiar with them enough. And plus, it would have taken us uh, hours and hours to finish that. So he chose you for salvation through sanctification, sanctification by the spirit, belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel. And I think that's key. The gospel is what calls us. That's why the Great Commission was given. That's why Paul and the rest of the apostles went out into all the world and preached the gospel everywhere that they went and why we're still under that mandate, if you want to call it, that encouragement, that, that uh, mission, if you will, of what we're about in the church, and that is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's what we talked about last week. And then he gives the reason for that is where we'll start this week, for the attaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what does it mean to obtaining the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ? What does that mean to you and me, do you think? Ellen? Well, first off, like you said, we hear the gospel. And of course, we go through the different steps or whatnot, but they have to be Perform in a certain order, and they have to be performed properly. Okay. Uh, for example, you can't be sprinkled and call yourself baptized. Okay. You can't accept. Well, you can't accept it, uh, faith through the Spirit before baptism in those churches that practice that. But it doesn't actually mean that you receive the faith or the Spirit rather until you're actually baptized. Okay. So they put the horse before the cart. Okay. And you can't do that. All right. All right. So we. The obtaining of the, the glory. What's glory? Let, let's 
define what we mean by that. Okay, the spirit. All right. What else? The actual glory of God Himself. Okay, glory of God Himself. If I were to go ahead, Bob. The reward. Okay, reward. All right, reward. If I give you glory for something, what am I doing? Praising you. I'm praising you. I am complimenting you. I'm trying to lift you up for something that you've done that's good, that I appreciate, or whatever the case may be. Now, how did Jesus achieve his glory? By ascending into heaven. Okay, by ascending into heaven after, after his death, burial, and resurrection. Father, return to me to you, to return me to the glory that I had before, is what he was wanting. So there was that that prized place, that that special and unique place that Jesus held. And when he did what he did, he went back in the glory of that because of what he had done. We read in Revelation about the return of the slain lamb uh, and how the heavens went literally crazy with praise for him when he came back. Yes, sir. When we think about children. Uh -huh. So we can be the glory of Christ if we are like him. Okay. So glory can be the image of, the representation of, the uh, uh, the uh, likeness of. Uh, it's it, Isn't it funny how there are some kids, when you see that kid, you just know who mom and dad are. You know, it doesn't always work that way. But but it's it's like, yeah, you're... You're your mom's daughter. You're your dad's son because it, they look so much alike. And uh, that, that in its essence is the idea there. We, we look like, we appear like that because of our relationship with, with Jesus. Flo? Well, in the real context, I mean, God calls us to salvation. Mm -hmm. And just like Jesus, you know, the Holy Son sent to earth on behalf of God and gave the right to voice and share it. Share in glory, that's the same for us. We can't share in God's element unless we call it salvation. Okay, yeah. I like that term, and can share in his element, that the glory is part of his element of where he exists and who he is. And we we in a sense share that here on this earth, but looking back at the broader context of first and second Thessalonians, when will we truly appreciate the full glory that comes from being in Jesus Christ? Just like we say, when the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall arise, that's when we'll appreciate all of that. So there's a, a portion of it now in the sense that we understand it, that we revel in it, but we're not going to appreciate the fullness of it until we get to that, that point. So we're obtaining the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting that we're obtaining that from our Lord or in relation to our Lord. That's, I think, key in that. We, we have to understand that it's related to him. The glory comes from him. We have access to the glory because of him and not because of anything else. Ellen? But also it requires obedience. Sure, absolutely. So I mean, have some, you know, Christ is completely mm -hmm. obedient in every way yeah. possible. Yeah. And that's the way we have to be too. Yeah, and exactly, and that's good because that's just what he comes off of uh, in that passage we just talked about. Through sanctification of the Spirit, believing in the truth, being called by the gospel, and what's implied in that is obeying the gospel in that in that in that context. And so, oops, wrong direction. So it's again, everything we do is for a single purpose, and that is heaven. That is our eternal salvation. And yes, that is involved in that is helping others find that eternal salvation, but that's what we're about in our lives. What can I do to make sure that I'm going to heaven? And again, we've talked about this before. It's not that I have a checklist of things I can do that's going to get me into heaven. We only get there by the grace of God. But as Elvin said, obedience and doing those things we're supposed to is a part of that as well. Uh, and we have to under, understand that. So we're called by our gospel to obtain the glory of the Lord. And so that's kind of the end of that thought. And then he build, starts building on another thought. Any other thoughts or comments on that before we move on? 
you know, real quickly, uh, uh, back to, you know, 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 through 20. For what is our crown and our glory? Is it not you? So in other words, every one of us here is valuable to each other. And that's why we have the relationships in Christ with one another, because we want you there with us. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the military, leave no one behind. Unfortunately, there are some people that are going to get left behind, no matter what we do, what we pray, or how, whatever, but we still have to continually try. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's, again, this, the whole whole focus of First and Second Thessalonians is, number one, the church was concerned about what happens when I die. The church was concerned more so, I think, especially as he addressed in First Thessalonians, okay, what's happened to those people who have already died in Christ? And if you come again, what's going to end? And what do we say our basic summation of that whole thing was? God's got it covered. Don't worry about it. God's got it covered. And that's what he's trying to express to them. And, and he's, he's obviously going into great detail about that. But the point is, you don't need to worry about that. God's got it covered. He's going to take care of the dead in Christ. He's going to take care of those who are alive in Christ. And if you're in Christ, you have no need to worry about the second coming of the Lord. All you have to do is make sure you're ready and, and uh, there when that time comes. And that's where he goes from here. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. Hold the traditions with which you were taught, whether by word or by our epistle. And so, <laughs> it kind of brings it full circle. Sanctification of the Spirit. Belief in the truth. Called by the gospel. And therefore, what do we do? You just stand fast. You stay in there and you keep working and you keep doing those things that you're supposed to do uh, for all of your life until the Lord comes again. And again, from the time of the epistles of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, uh, mid to late 1st century, to now it's been about 2,000 years and he hasn't come again. And uh, Peter talks about that. The scoffers say, well, where is he? He hadn't come. It's been all this time he hasn't come. And that was, <laughs> they were saying that in the first century. So imagine how critics might say 2,000 years later, well, where is he? And what does that mean for us? Well, it means, Kevin, that you live your life every day as though that's the day the Lord's going to come. And if he doesn't come, you're going to be one of those dead in Christ. And what's going to happen? You'll rise first. And then those who are alive will meet him in the air. And so again, God's got it covered. We don't need to be concerned about that part of it. Because if we die in Christ, uh, we use this as an illustration that you've got a golden ticket to heaven. And that's a, a, a beautiful thing for us to think about. And we know so many people who have gone on to their reward. And uh, we're thankful for that. And we can be, yes, we're sad about that. But we can be joyful in the fact that we know where they are and where they're going to spend their eternity. So, therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions with which you were taught, whether by word or epistle. What's a tradition? Something you do over and over. Something you do over and over. Okay. Do you have family traditions at Thanksgiving, Christmas? Some people do. Some people do the same thing every year or, or something similar. They have a uh, for the Ballard family, uh, I don't know what we call this a tradition, but uh, we generally, because we've got daughters-in-law and they've got family and we try not to take all their time, although we wish they'd just stay with us the whole holiday, but they can't do that. So we've, over the last, well, how many years, we've done Thanksgiving breakfast. We get together, have a breakfast, and, and uh, eat together and enjoy some time together on Thanksgiving morning and then after breakfast they tear off to the in-laws and do what they've got to do for the rest of the day and that's our tradition. Uh, that's what works for us. And you may have different traditions. Um, so, Les. It causes me to wonder if this is the same word here that Jesus used in condemning the Pharisees when he said you may void the commandments of God I'm wondering if this word might be a different word and might have a very heavier meaning. It's the same word, paradosis, in all uh, uh, Matthew 15, 2, 3, 6, Matthew, uh, Mark 7, uh, 
uh, 3 and 5, Mark 8, uh, basically all the, all the places I could find within the New Testament where that word was used, it was a variation of that Greek word paradosis. Uh, and it's obviously different depending on the syntax and context of all, all of that. So it's the same word, and that's, but that's the good point because that's where I was going with this discussion. Traditions, Jesus used it in a negative context. Uh, somebody would look up Matthew 15, 2 through 6. Uh, somebody get Mark 7. Somebody get Galatians 1, uh, Colossians 2, 1 Peter 1. Uh, let's read those passages real quickly and, and look at the negative context of this term tradition. Somebody have Matthew 15? Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? They do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Okay. They do not, why do your disciples transgress the tradition? Because they do not eat the, wash their hands before they eat the bread. Okay, so keep that one in mind. Mark 7, 3. Dallas? The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, according to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. When the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating the food of unclean demons? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, the teachings of the fools taught by men. You let go the commands of God and are holding on to the tra traditions of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way. You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, Whatever, you, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is corbin, that is, a gift devoted to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Okay, so... Tradition in that sense, obviously negative from Jesus' mind and what they were doing. You follow traditions rather than the word of God. Uh, Galatians 1.14. Flo? Uh, put that in context. It really says to me, says, you know what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion. My body and the spirit to serve God's way. I did my best in the soil. I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in my zeal for the traditions of my ancestors. Okay. So Paul talking about his past life in Judaism and how he followed, zealously followed the traditions of his followers. Uh, Colossians 2 8. Les? Uh, this is the new King James Version. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the word, and not world, and not according to the Christ. Okay. And 1 Peter 1 18. But one eighteen. I was on that. Sorry about that. You can read that with words. Much as you know that you were not recommend redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Okay. So just those passages, just focusing on those passages, and again, so many others in the gospels, and especially Jesus used that we won't read. What was a tradition in that context? Okay, human made. Less? I was going to say what, what the Pharisees and others. Okay. All right. So we have understanding history. We had, for the, the Jewish people, we had obviously the Old Testament, uh, which was their, their scripture. But then there was the commentary on the scripture, and there was the commentary on the commentary on the scripture. And by the time Jesus came around, things that were never in the Old Testament had become so much of a law that if you transgressed that, you were in danger of being kicked out of the synagogue or thrown out of the temple because you didn't do what the Father said uh, you were supposed to do. And Jesus condemned the Pharisees because he told them, you bind things on people, but you yourselves won't even lift with your little finger. 
And so this idea of tradition in this particular context is negative, isn't it? It's, it's a, a teaching that's not from God, it's not from Scripture, that has been made on the order of Scripture and expected to be followed in the same manner as Scripture. And so in that context, tradition is what? It's wrong, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, it's unacceptable. Now, are we saying that there's anything wrong with traditions in a general sense? Marcia. Well, the traditions can be dangerous if mm -hmm. you're bound to them. Yes. Uh, and, and so we have to remember that we're bound by the law, not by sure. our traditions. Sure. So if if we again if we elevate tradition to scripture, then we're we're in trouble at that point. And going back to our illustration with our family, if we were let's say for some reason that on one Thanksgiving, uh, one set of the kids their family planned something else and they couldn't even be there on Thanksgiving. And the others did the same. And so we're home alone on Thanksgiving. We say, well, fine, if y'all don't want to be with us, we don't want to see you anymore either. What would that be? A, what would that tradition have become? <laughs> it, it, it'd be divisive, wouldn't it? It'd be wrong. Uh, so so traditions, traditions are understood in the context. They can be good. They can be helpful. They can be something that we remember with fondness. But when you take them to the level of controlling other people's behavior, that's where they become they become dangerous. Bob. You know, we, we view traditions like here's so many times out in the world that change is good. We need to change. And then we spread the traditions. Traditions neither good nor bad. It's what generated the tradition mm -hmm. what we do with it. I like to think uh, my family has a tradition of being here every Sunday. You could argue that, well, the only reason why we're here is because it's tradition. Well, okay. Uh, but the good part about it is that I am here every Sunday to listen to what's going on with God. So the tradition itself is good. You can argue what making the call behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes we do things out of tradition that are good, and it kind of works us through the, the, the rough patches. Mm -hmm. You may not be feeling it this Sunday morning, but you're going because it's tradition that you go, and hopefully something during the day starts and picks you up and go the other way. Yeah, absolutely. So traditions in and of themselves are neither good nor bad. It's And, and even... Even sometimes my motivation when I'm doing that tradition may not apply to it per se. It's when that tradition takes on the form of, shall we just use this blanket term gospel, it's something we have to do, and if you don't do this tradition, then boy, you're in big trouble. That becomes an issue. That becomes where, where it's wrong. Flo and then Ellen. Tradition becomes stopping blocks. They can be, yes. If we issue a circumcision, we're stopping blocks yeah. really to really to and what Paul I think is trying to tell us here is that yes, uh, we're called to salvation, we can share in the glory of God, but that's not a given unless we do what he says next. Be firm, strong, uh -huh. don't compromise the truth. Right. When that happens, all those other things he talked about there are not, not a given. Yeah. Yeah. Ellen? Well, it's interesting when you do research on different churches and you look at the articles of faith, mm -hmm. some of those things are 15 pages long, and it absolutely has nothing to do with the Bible in one sense, mm -hmm. because they added all these things in there that you have to do in order to become saved. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so traditions can be negative, uh, they can be positive, they can be, I would dare say, even neutral, just Something we do that maybe you know, we don't have a strong feeling for it, we don't have a strong feeling against it. Uh, do you remember when it was decided? You remember what used to sit right here? The Lord's table, which is in the back over there now. For those of you who were here, wasn't there some consternation when we decided we weren't going to have that table up here anymore? And that the men were going to bring the trays from the back. Not that we use trays anymore after COVID. But they were going to bring from the back. And there were some people who questioned that on the basis of Scripture. And 
Yeah. And we're honest and sincere with that. I'm not going to fault anybody who, who had trouble with that. We understand that having a communion table the way we did was a traditional way to do things, but it wasn't the only way to do things. And we decided since Grady and I tend to like to wander around down here while we preach, that we would move that, give us more room to do that, and make it a little more informal in the class and things like that. And so it was a change made because we felt it was a tradition and that we could do that in another way just as easily. Is the Lord's Supper a tradition? It's a command. Okay. You sure about that? Less? In the sense that it's something that we do repeatedly, but the repetition is part of the reason Jesus commanded it because he didn't want us to forget. Okay. So, and I have a reason for saying it that way because we're going to look at a couple of passages where we just read one. Let's go ahead and get there. Uh, somebody in 1 Corinthians uh, 11 and verse 2. And 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6. We've got the Corinth, Corinth passage. Don't fight over it now. Okay, Dave. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions. Just as, I have, just as I delivered them to you. Okay. Keep the traditions. Paul is saying this with the force of apostolic authority. Keep the traditions I've delivered to you. All right? 2 Thessalonians 3 6. Who's got that? Les? So we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. Okay. So we've got two passages there where the word tradition is used, same Greek word, uh, same root Greek word in those, in those contexts, but it's used in a sense of, okay, you need to follow these traditions. You need to follow these traditions. Old King James sometimes uses the word ordinance uh, in, uh, in that context. Sandy? Well, and the NIV tends to say teachings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like in this one. So, traditions, teachings, ordinances. And again, as we, we said earlier in class, it depends on where that tradition is coming from. If it's coming from Scripture, this is what you do. We could look back and say, yes, the Lord's Supper is a tradition. But it's not a tradition in the sense of something we just decided to do and we can change it or do whatever we want to or not have it or, or do it once a month. There's a difference between a tradition that is based in Scripture from a, a command from God and a tradition of something that we've come up with. Could we? Let me look at the order of worship this morning. Okay, we're going to have welcome and opening prayer, two songs, second prayer, another song, scripture reading, Grady's lesson, invitation song, another song, Lord's Supper, closing song, closing prayer and announcements. We generally, the only thing we alter in that Sometimes we have the Lord's Supper before the sermon. So is this order of worship, would we call it a tradition? Can be. Can be. Yeah, I mean, and is there anything wrong with it the way it is? No. Flo? Well, we come to the music of Mountain Elder. We have members that come to us and concern about how many songs we sing until the scripture or the prayer mm -hmm. or the Lord's Supper or we said it the first or the end of the service. And when those concerns become issues like that, I think those are stumbling blocks. Mm -hmm. And that's when tradition becomes a problem. Because we allow them to, to guide our worship to our Father instead of letting the Scripture mm -hmm. guide us. Yeah. And unfortunately, that happens a lot. Yeah. Steve? I think tradition is a means to an end in a good sense. I mean, we can give the example of carpooling. Mm -hmm. You can say carpooling is a good tradition uh, to come to church. But I think where the Pharisees had it wrong specifically is that they were making the, the example of a carpool as part of the commandment mm -hmm. and not the, you know, what the purpose of it is, which is to worship yeah. and to come together and fellowship. So, go ahead, Les. I'm not sure I didn't hear all of Flo's comments, but here's, here's a tradition that would bother us if we changed it, I think, even though we have scriptural basis to do so. Um, Matthew has, when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, the 
bread into the cup. Luke reverses that. The cup into the bread. I wonder what would happen if we get feedback if we suddenly reverse the order mm -hmm. of the cup and the bread. Yeah. The answer is yes, you would get feedback. <laughs> yeah, of I, we, we would certainly do that. Uh, the, the, wow, <laughs> class went quickly. The point here is everything we do needs to be tested in Scripture. And again, let's just use a simple one baptism for the remission of sins. You can call that a tradition. But it's a tradition that rises to the level of ordinance, of teaching, of, of doctrine, and things of that nature. The order of our worship service, well, that's tradition. And the elements of the worship service are ordinances and commands. But the order in which we do them, we have no, no scriptural reference for that as, as to how they do that. Uh, if we're going to get nitpicky about that, then Grady and I would strongly endorse preaching until midnight that Paul did because we have that example and uh, you know we start at what 10 o'clock in the morning and go to midnight uh, I no, I, I don't think I would either but at the same time when we we just got to be careful with that and it's it's an issue of of again can that become a stumbling block if we Make it doctrine when it's not. Yes, that can be a bad, a bad thing. And so we, we, we understand the tradition is, is neither positive nor negative in and of itself. Just like money is neither good nor bad in and of itself. It's a matter of how you use it, how you think about it, what you do. So that's why we're always in Scripture trying to figure out: okay, is what we're doing number one? Is what we're doing something we can trace back to New Testament times? And are we doing all those things that we can trace back to New Testament times that are expected of us? But then at the same time, there are traditions that we have that, that are, are good, that are comfortable to us. And that, again, going back to tradition, isn't that why we like tradition and order? Because it, it, it's something we can depend on. It's something we can count on. It's something we're, we're comfortable with. And, and we like that. We like that idea and that that, that concept. Uh, you go to a funeral, and you kind of expect certain things from a funeral because it's a traditional funeral, and uh, and we we appreciate that because it, it, it resonates with us. But at the same time, when you take something that is not scripture and elevate it to the point of scripture, then yeah, that's when we find ourselves in trouble. Unless you had a comment. So you're advocating that we pay you. <laughs> so here, here's, here's another point that I, I think is important to be made across the both congregations that I've served as an elder. When a member came to us and asked us for a change in something we were doing, first you go to scripture to find an example and limitation. Second, if there's nothing there, is that change beneficial? Mm -hmm. And then the third, very important question is, if we make that change, what impact will that have later on? What will it lead to? Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important question we have to ask. Absolutely. And, and that's, that's the difficulty with things that fall under uh, what we call, fancy term, expediency. Uh, it's expedient to do it this way. But sometimes that expedience gets elevated to Scripture. And... and You know what I've got to say? I'm not much on change. I kind of like it the same way all the time. How many of you are that way? Yeah, a few of you admit it. Several of you would admit it, but you just don't want to raise your hand. We're, we're not creatures of change. We don't like to change that much. Uh, but sometimes change is good. Sometimes I am getting so much of a rut that I don't even know why I'm doing it the way that I'm doing it and need to be shaken out of that and, and realize that just, just because you're doing it that way doesn't mean it's the best way or the right way. There could be other ways that you could be doing this. And so that's, again, it's, it's, we're talking about, it's not an easy concept. It's something we've got to always be vigilant about. Vicki and then Flo. Well, as someone who grew up in the church, you know, black communities will say the church trusts the seat you thought you're in a church. Mm -hmm. 
And that's fine. <coughs> that's the way church wants to do it. But when you start condemning a congregation yeah. for not doing two songs in yeah. prayer, then I think you got a problem. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, our service is what it is. Every once in a while, Grady and I will get radical. And he'll preach part of a sermon and I'll lead a song. And then he'll preach some more. And I'll lead a song. And he'll preach some more and I'll lead a song. That's not traditional, is it? Uh -huh. Sandy said it's not scriptural either. So, <laughs> Elders? <laughs> Got a problem over here. Bob? Maybe more traditional than we like to think. Yeah, it could be more traditional than we like to think. So again... And don't want to make fun of any of this because some of this stuff has divided churches. I mean, ripped them apart. So we don't want to make light of that, of that issue. But again, let's back up. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. And I think part of that stand fast admonishment is you hang on to, again, the tradition. And what he's talking about here is tradition in the sense of ordinances and, and scripture and, and doctrine and, and teaching that he has given to the church of Thessalonica or the church of Philippi or wherever and said, you stand fast in that. All this other stuff is an outgrowth of that, but you've got to stand fast in that or the rest of it won't mean anything either. Because if you're not in scripture, it doesn't matter what you're doing because you're not where you need to be. All right, we're out of time. Appreciate all your comments this morning. Uh, we'll pick up there, Lord willing, next Sunday morning.